over to you, okay. Chair. Okay, so welcome everybody to this virtual standards committee meeting that's being conducted um, with members and officers at various locations, mostly their houses, I suspect, communicating via audio, video and online. There's also the opportunity for the public and press to listen and view proceedings, um, I think through YouTube, is that right? That's correct, Chair. Okay. Before the meeting starts, I'd like to invite the committee member and scrutiny manager, Hilary Deneen, to explain how proceedings will work and to confirm that members and officers are indeed in attendance. Thank you, Chair. So the first thing I'll do is call, uh, make a roll call, if you can just answer um, so that we can confirm that you can hear and be heard. Councillor Aspinwall? Yep, I'm here. Thank you. Councillor Claire Billing? Yes, I'm here. Councillor Judy Billing? I'm here. Councillor Brown? I'm here. Councillor Levitt? Yeah. Councillor Morris? Yes. Uh, Councillor Prendergast? Yes, I'm here. Councillor Steers Hanscom? Yes, I'm here. Councillor Strong? Present. And then we have uh, Parish Councillor Martin Griffin. I'm here. Uh, Parish Councillor Rebecca Elliott. Yeah. Nicholas Moss, independent person. I'm here. Peter Chapman, reserve independent person. I'm here. Uh, John Richardson, reserve independent person. Here. Officers Jeanette Thompson. Evening, yes, present. Thank you. Uh, we have Vic Godfrey um, helping with the IT tonight and myself, Hilary Deneen. Thank you. Have I missed anybody? Uh, Councillor Mike Rice. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, so the meeting is being live streamed on the Council's YouTube channel and also recorded via Zoom. If the live streaming fails, the meeting will adjourn. If the live stream cannot be restored within a reasonable period, then the remaining business will be considered at a later date. Please stay in view of the camera at all times. If for any reason the meeting is not court, an officer will notify attendees. The meeting will adjourn immediately. Once the meeting is court, the meeting will resume. If the connection cannot be restored within a reasonable period, then the remaining business will be, be considered at a later date. Only members present for the entire debate and consideration of an item are entitled to vote. If a remote member loses connection, the chair may adjourn the meeting for a short period to enable reconnection. If the chair does not adjourn the meeting, the member will be deemed to have left the meeting at the point of failure and to have returned at the point of re-establishment. To ensure that, please ensure that your mobile phone and other noise emitting devices are muted. And please activate the mute button on your tablet or computer when you are not speaking and be mindful that other people can see you. If a member wishes to speak, they should use the raise hand button. And this is located in the participant section at the bottom of your screens. Um, and um, it will alert the chair and the chair will then invite you to speak. Um, when requested to vote, and this is for members only, voting will be in the usual way. I'm not going to go through how that's done because I think you all know. Are there any questions before we start the meeting? In that case, I'll hand over to the Chair, Councillor Judy Billing. Thank you. Item one on the agenda is apologies for absence. Um, we've been joined this evening and, and, and um, Martin Griffin and, and Rebecca are very welcome, but Martin, I believe, has to leave the meeting at eight o'clock. So we, we know that he's not just disappearing uh, without trace, he has got to leave. Um, the other apology we've had um, is from Julia McGill, who unfortunately um, is no longer qualified to be a member of this committee because she ceased to be a parish councillor. Um, and that, that's really disappointing. Um, and I think we should place on record our thanks to her for being part of this outfit for a while. Um, and I shall certainly miss her. Um, item two is notification of other business and none has been advised. Item three is chair's announcements. Um, and I've already welcomed um, Rebecca and Martin because I was ahead of myself, um, but there's no harm in welcoming them twice, I think. 
Um, and of course, we also welcome the reserve independent person, John Richardson, um, who's been appointed for that post since this committee last met. Um, and I'm sure who will be an enormous asset to this group. They're all new to the NHDC Standards Committee and they're all very welcome indeed, uh, because welcoming people is what we do at North Arts whenever we possibly can. Um, in accordance with council policy, this meeting is being audio recorded as well as filmed. The audio recordings will be available to view on ModGov and the film recording via the NHDC, NHDC YouTube channel, um, for which I'm sure there'll be an enormous fee and a tremendous demand when they're made available. Um, three, item, members are reminded to make declarations of interest before an item. A detailed reminder about this and speaking rights is set out under Chair's announcements on the agenda. So you have that in front of you. Item four is um, the opportunity for public participation, but none has been um, notified this evening. Item five is the meat of our meeting, which is, of course, standards matters. Um, and I'm going to ask um, Jeanette Thompson, Service Director, Legal and Community and Monitoring Officer for our Council, um, to present that report. So over to you, Jeanette. Unmuted, please. Yes, that would help. Um, thank you, Chair. Yeah, I think just to explain for those that, um, because we tend to only have usually one report, um, we usually go through just the sections. So if anyone's got any comment at the end of it, I won't go over the whole of the report. I'll just mention briefly each section. And if anyone wants to comment at that stage, then that tends to be what we do. If you're happy with uh, that chair, that's the way I propose to, to go through this report briefly. Absolutely. Yeah, if I see a blue hand go up at any point, I will stop you and, and turn to that member. Yeah. Lovely. Okay, so just as a, an update then, um, obviously for uh, a couple of occasions now I've been updating members regarding the Committee on Standards in Public Life and their recommendations on uh, local government ethical standards. Um, as members will recall, and uh, I set out in the report, there were 26 recommendations back in January of 2019, um, and the committee considered that in the February, and uh, a lot of those uh, would have required government response in terms of uh, legislation being changed, etc., and guidance. Uh, but there was also about 15 to local government um, to deal with uh, good practice recommendations. So, as I would say, we um, have, I'll just mention our. Jeanette, your sound quality is very bad. Is, oh, there yeah. any, is there any way you could? Be a bit closer to us, sound wise. I'll, I'll, I'll try. <laughs> it must be the headpiece, I'm afraid. So, um, the first update relates to the fact that behind the scenes, local government association decided to act on one of the recommendations, which was for a model code of conduct. And they launched a consultation, as members will be aware, in between June and 17th of August, so the 8th of June, 17th of August, and the committee saw proposals and commented on our response as a standards committee, and that was uploaded in August. Now, these were due to be fed into a final draft um, that was going to be reviewed by the Executive Advisory Board and then presented to um, the LGA General Assembly, which was uh, the meeting on the 13th of September. But I haven't seen that on the agenda. And although I made some inquiries, I haven't heard back from uh, the LGA yet. So I'll just have to keep an eye out and see where they go with that. In July, the chair of the committee, Lord Evans, wrote to uh, the Secretary of State for Housing, um, Communities and Local Government and asked for a formal response, because normally you would have that within about three months of these types of reports. We all know there's been a lot going on in the meantime, and uh, this is also a follow-up to a letter that was sent in October of 2019 to Luke Hall. Um, again, I've had a look on the uh, committee's website. I can't see any response to that yet. Um, hardly surprising, really. 
at the same, same time in July, the chair also wrote to local government and said, uh, could you start implementing, if you haven't, the 15 best practice recommendations? Um, and for those that weren't on the committee, we went through that in February of 2019. We were complying with most of them, if not actually set out in procedures in, in the spirit of them. But the committee at the time um, agreed for us to include recommendations six and eight um, into our complaints handling arrangements, which was to include a public interest test in the criteria for dealing with complaints and also to recognise that the independent person would be involved from the outset uh, of when complaints come in as well as after investigations had been um, commissioned. And although that's not reflected in the legislation, that's certainly what they felt that would be good practice. So we updated our complaints handling procedure at the time uh, back in May 2019 to reflect that. The only one that we weren't complying with at the time, and we're still not complying with, is um, an annual review of our code of conduct, which I think during last year, certainly, um, we took the view that we were waiting to see what the government's response was to the recommendation uh, on a model code. And obviously this year, there's been the consultation on that. So I think, you know, this is a matter for members as to whether they think it's the opportune time for me to either carry on and review our code now or to wait to see what happens with the LGA consultation because I certainly think it's an opportunity to wrap those two things in together and decide whether you know anything further ought to be done with our own codes or we adopt the LGA version um, and I mentioned that as well because as part of the consultation the LGA did asked whether we'd be interested in, in guidance and other associated documents. And I think if that's something that the council would want to adopt, then it would be straightforward to also look at any other sort of supporting documentation um, that they had. So Chair, if someone, if you want me to stop at the stage and, and anyone wants to comment um, at this juncture, more than happy. Okay, thank you very much. It's also true to say that we, did involve ourselves in some of the consultation events um, that the LGA put on um, in July, August. I can't remember when they were, um, but, but there were a couple of quite interesting events that we took part in at that time. So does anybody want to comment? It's not looking terribly as though they do. Um, I'm assuming, Hilary, that a blue hand comes up on on, on the little faces as well as on the chat line, yeah? That's correct, Chair. Um, if you look on your participants list, they come up in order of hands yeah. raised. And now Councillor Levitt, you should be able to see Councillor Levitt has raised his hand. Okay, so I now see that Councillor Levitt has raised his hand. David. Thank you. Uh, it's just really, I think, reiterating what we said before, it, wait for the the new guidelines to come out because there's very little point in going into all the time and effort to change our code of conduct only to find we have to either abandon it and take a different one or, or change it again in a in a couple of months time that's just my totally, thought on that. totally agree david that's really helpful thank you um there's really no point inventing a wheel before another wheel is going to be invented that we might then have to reinvent ourselves in okay any other comments? I'm not seeing any other hands, in which case, carry on, Jeanette. Okay. Um, the other two items for national standards are mentioned um, as for information purposes, really, and that's at the Committee of Standards and Public Life, also conducting um, a review of electoral registration in terms of uh, of the review I set out there. So at the moment, they're sort of gathering evidence and they'll be reporting in due course on that one. And they've also started a Standards Matters 2 landscape, which um, I don't know whether it will have um, any implications for us as local authorities, but it's a bit of a sad state of affairs if we're going on to two when we haven't even um, implemented one. But, um, we are where we are, so some of the things I'll be looking at is really whether the seven principles of public life, no one principles really remain um, fit for practice as well as other issues set out at under 8.4. So I'll stop briefly there. 
No? Okay. There's I'm no blue on. hand, so carry on. <laughs> So locally, also, we uh, provide a summary of the reports and complaints that we've received since uh, certainly for this year, because we haven't had um, a committee meeting this year. And we're up to six, um, well, noted complaints, although one you will note for 2020 has three councillors involved. Um, that is ongoing at the moment, but it's due to be confirmed um, shortly. And under 8.6, it just summarises that we have had um, an ongoing issue with Great Ashbury Community Council. I think as I set out in the annual report, um, there seems to be ongoing issues um, at the council in terms of different members okay. often getting copied in. So um, you will note that one made a complaint to the local government ombudsman in relation to complaints that were dealt with last year and um, that wasn't taken any further by the um lgo and that was confirmed in august okay so happy to stop there for a second yeah i'm stopping you there because um i've got sean prendergast um who i think put his hand up on eight five I did. Thank you, Chair. Um, I don't know whether this question can be answered, but I noticed in complaint 1 2020, it was referred to an external investigator. Am I able to know who is the subject of that complaint and does it um, relate to the point of order raised by Councillor Hone in January 2020? Jeanette, I think you are able to know. Because... I, I'm, I'm able to confirm because the Councillor who was complained about, as this is now concluded, has given his consent to confirm that it is Councillor Sam North that the person that was complained about. But that's, that's as far as I'm able to confirm at this juncture. And can I just make it clear for everybody that you're only confirming that because he's given his consent to be named? Yes. Yeah. Yes. OK. Thank you. Is that all right, Sean? Thank okay. you. Um, I've got Gerald Morris. Thank you, Chair. Um, on 8.6, where it says the last sentence, the LGO's decision was to close the complaint in August following their initial inquiries. Does close the complaint mean that, uh, it, a, a, that um, there was no, there, the complaint was inappropriate? Is that what it means? Essentially, yes, because um, they don't have re they can look at whether we followed our procedures, um, but they don't have the remit to investigate it more fully if it's councillor against councillor, which it was in that situation. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'm not seeing any more hands, so do you want to go on to 8 7, Jeanette? Yes, uh, one of the issues that often uh, gets raised is about member training. And obviously, because of the coronavirus, we didn't have the election and we tend to tie in the training uh, of members, new and um, obviously previously appointed members, um, around about the induction time, so May and June of each year. We didn't do any this year because of the, the fact that the elections were postponed, cancelled. And um, I suppose that is a question. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of training that members have to undergo, but at best, um, we won't be looking to do conduct training until again next May or um, June after the election. So, in the meantime, is there something that members feel would or should be covered uh, or offered out? Um, perhaps just obviously to the district members, but we might be able to offer it out slightly wider, dependent on the cost and who, who's providing it. Um, I suggested one of the areas that came up, which is the um, use of social media, but obviously I'm open to any um, recommendation, and that links back to recommendation 2.2, Chair. Any comments on that, anybody? We're hoping to be linking in um, on November the 9th as another side issue about social media with some of the major social media providers in the area to talk about relationships between the council and Facebook pages 
and what we can expect of each other. So that, that would actually be quite interesting in that connection. Claire, strong. Thank you, Chairman. Um, just on training, and it, I mean, I know we have got the planning advisory service in giving planning training at the moment. So um, that is happening, which is good um, and available to all members, but particularly for the planning control. But also, I know we talk about training, but uh, to one of today's meetings I was at, which was on the shaping our future, um, and we had a discussion around the sessions that uh, the uh, employers of the council are receiving on that programme. And we did ask, as the councillors on it, if we could also have a session for ourselves. I don't necessarily always think that is sort of strict training, but I think perhaps it's something that we ought to think about more rather than just training, but information sessions as well. I think that's, that's absolutely right, because, you know, we lump everything under the heading of training, but that very often isn't what we meant, uh, what we mean. Um, I wonder if it's worth waiting just a little bit until we find out what the LGA is going to do with its new code of conduct. Uh, and that might be a key moment to have some both information and training and development. And what do you think, if that's all right with you, Claire? Um, yeah, yes, it's, I just think that when we're, when we're looking at, um, you know, when looking at the you know, councillors and what information we receive, it, we ought to just recognise that there is training and there's also other information that Absolutely. we... Absolutely. And I think it, it's a good, you know, I think it's something perhaps that also ought to be kind of regard, regard, recorded that, that we're also doing that because it's then yeah. visible to the public. Yeah, I think that's quite right. I've now got an enormously long list of people who want to speak. Isn't it funny the way these things go? I must um, have said so, something controversial then. I don't think so. I think um, we've got Mike left, Mike Rice. Thank you, Chair. Um, I've already spoken to Jeanette about, um, well, no, actually not spoken to her, but sent her an email reference, social media. Um, and I feel that ought to be covered in the uh, code of conduct. Um, I appreciate we're waiting for updates in the code of conduct, but I think it's very important that it is included in the code of conduct and that um, everybody gets training particularly on that point because I think it's getting out of hand in the council. Okay, thank you very much, Mike. Um, the next person on the list to speak is Ruth Brown. Thank you, Chair. Um, I was going to say that I think the idea of having some training on use of social media would be helpful for all of us. Um, and actually, um, the Hertfordshire Association of parish and town councils have just run some training on something called effective communications which was a lot about using social media and so you could almost um i mean i hear what what councillor rice says but you could almost tie in effective communications and conduct into kind of one training so it's not just about what you shall not do and what you must avoid but it's more more positive about how can you effectively communicate to all sorts of people about council business um, and keep residents informed appropriately uh, without breaking the code of conduct um, and, and in the spirit of it. So I, I personally would value that. I've been a councillor for two and a half years and I've never had any training on social media. So I'd, I personally would really value it. Okay. Um, there are two ways we can go about that. One is through the standards regime and the standards committee. And the other is through the member champions group that you and I are both members of um, and raise it there and put on something more generic that covers standards issues, but actually much broader than that. Is, is that all right if we do it that way, Ruth? That's really what I was suggesting, because I okay. think that makes you cover the positive and the more less positive side. I mean, okay. I don't know how many councillors would sign up for being told they can't do this and they can't say that. Um, but but all of us want to be able to communicate effectively surely yeah. so I would have thought that would be a, a bigger a better sell really and and you you, you include the standards in that office uh, of course okay thank you very much um I've got Claire Billing now hi um I just wanted to check what um training is compulsory for councillors to do and what's the percentage of councillors that have taken that up I think the answer is that, that there is no compulsory standards training, is there, Jeanette? Your 
You're muted, Jeanette. I thought I had taken it off mute. Apologies. Um, we haven't made it well. I think the recommendations should have training, um, and certainly in the past, we try to make sure that everyone, especially the new councillors, do have code of conduct and governance training. And it's been reasonably successful. The last couple of years, we've had some really good turnout. Um, so I would hope, and actually, you know, as compared to other training that we've offered in the past, it, we have sort of 30 to 40 people, you know, members attending from the district councillors, which is almost, you know, perfect compared to some of the others. Um, but we will certainly look to try and ensure that members have that next year, regardless. But we don't make it a compulsory requirement as such. I mean, the thought behind my question is to do with um, safeguarding and responsibilities for safeguarding. Well, we have that as, as a separate training, Claire. Right. The safeguarding. I think it's it would be quite useful, I mean, obviously, as both Ruth and um, Judy are the training champions, tie that all in and, and, and work out what you think. Because I think part of the problem is that overloading members, I, I've certainly put it forward because I know that it might be a question that comes up. If you feel it's, if you want specifically to recommend training, then we can provide it. You might equally, if you've suggested, tie that into all the other things that you're offering members. But in the meantime, um, everyone needs to be aware that there is a, an online module on, on the Grow Zone um, on safeguarding um, for us. Ruth, did yes, you want to come yes. back? I just wanted to respond. I think there's going to be a safeguarding um, online a sort of live Zoom session on the 26th of November. Yeah. So it'd be good for members to take advantage of that if they're able to attend. Um, and just to answer Claire's other question, the take up on safeguarding training was actually very high was the highest of all the member training. Yeah. yeah if you, can I interrupt as well? It's Hilary. Um, just to let you know that um, an email went out today to all members regarding <laughs> safeguarding the training. Did it? I must have missed that. <laughs> Maybe it's because yeah. I've been county council all day. Hilary was but, very good. <laughs> that's excellent. Okay, so I've got David Levitt, Rebecca Elliott, Peter and Nicholas. So David, you first. Thank you, Judy. Um, it's it's back onto the media training. Then we've we've got down the social media training. But uh, about four years ago, we did a really good media training session with a guy who came from outside again, uh, and he told us about uh, it wasn't just about social media. It was about dealing with the press, how you deal with the press, uh, how, uh, and your responsibilities as a councillor when you're dealing with the press, when you should write letters or declare that you're a councillor and when you shouldn't uh, and I think the basic thing was you should always say you're a councillor but it was a really really good training and uh, I think Ruth just said that, that she's had no sort of media training on that sort of side of it at all and I think quite a lot of the current members have, have missed out on that and it, it was a really good session and I think you were at it as well Judy from memory. I was, I yep. was, yeah I was um, and yes that's something we should revisit and we will revisit um, Rebecca, welcome. Uh, thank you. So with respect to um, 8.7 and the training and um, social media training, it just occurred to me from a parish council perspective, um, over the last um, couple of weeks in St. Ipilet, sorry, a couple of months, um, obviously we've had discussions about various planning issues and local um, protest groups have been set up on Facebook so there'll be, you know, the Brookside Estate Group or the Gosmore Go Group, for example. And they have started to want to engage and expect the parish council to respond to them directly. So obviously we've discussed this as parish council members and we've tried to be cautious about, you know, how we respond. But I do think that this is quite relevant because the expectation, particularly of some of the younger members um, in the community is, well, why can't you answer me directly? You know, I've asked you a question, can you answer me directly? So I think from a code of conduct and standards perspective, it is quite a live issue at the local level. 
I think it absolutely is. And certainly uh, many North Hearts district councillors will tell you that we, um, I was going to say suffer, but that, that's a bit dramatic, um, from the same sort of syndrome. And why, why have you not answered the question that I posted on social media three seconds ago? Um, and that's partly why we're having the meeting I described of the new um, community engagement and co co cooperative development panel on the 9th of November to have those sorts of conversations with some of the social media providers, actually. I think it's a huge issue that's being talked about at every level of local government. So thanks for raising that, Rebecca. Um, and, and we need to think more about it. Peter. Uh, well, I just wanted to uh, remind everybody that we do have a code of conduct for uh, members uh, regarding social media. However, and it, it, it's, we've had it for a long time now, uh, and listening to uh, the comments that uh, councillors have been making, it obviously, it, it seems to me to be pretty inadequate because it was basically aimed at, at trying to prevent councillors from um, uh, unfortunate use of mobile phones at the wrong time. Uh, whereas, you know, you're talking about a far broader range of, uh, as, as the whole issue of social media has developed. Um, and I just wonder, maybe the sensible thing would be to wait for the LGA outcome. But um, I think it needs to go onto our agenda as something that needs serious looking at so we can codify what is appropriate and what isn't appropriate. OK, thank you, Peter. I'm, I'm sure that's right. Uh, Nicholas. Thank you. Yes, I just was going to echo what Peter has just said. But uh, just going back to something I think, was it Claire Billing was asking about uh, making training compulsory? And um, I was interested in, in understanding well, I know the extent to which people turn up for training um, of their own volition. And just a, as a note under the code of conduct, the committee does have the power to make training compulsory. I mean, I don't think it's ever invoked that power, as far as I can recall, and Jeanette will know better than I do. Um, but it just struck me that uh, given the present circumstances, maybe uh, the committee would want to consider making certain training compulsory um, because it's able to do so. OK, thank you. I mean, some of that, if it was going to be invoked, should be done at, at um, um, uh, first entry of councillors at induction time, I think, when it really is most important for people to understand what they're coming into and what the responsibilities are. Um, and it certainly is included and will be included in the uh, programme for next May um, for new councillors, but also existing councillors are welcome at those sessions as well. Uh, but I think we do, we do need to come back to the question of compulsion, and we will do that. Thank you, Nicholas. I haven't got any other hands up on this issue, so I'm wondering then whether Jeanette would like to go on to 8-8. Um, eight, eight. Yes, that's just the final thing, and obviously, Chair, you've welcomed our new reserve independent person, John Richardson, and the two new co-optees uh, to the Standards Committee. Martin Griffin and Rebecca Elliott. So other than that, um, I'm going to suggest, Chair, that the MS has further comments on that. The welcome uh, that we go to the recommendation. OK, so the recommendations, no, no blue hands, no blue meanies, no. Um, the recommendations are that the committee notes the content of the report uh, and two, two, that the Standards Committee makes any recommendations for further ethical standards and or training provision to councillors to the monitoring officer that it deems appropriate. Now, we have made a number of suggestions between us, um, which I presume the monitoring officer is going to pick up and take away and run with. Is that right, Jeanette? Yeah, she's nodding. She's nodding. Yeah. <laughs> And, and, I shall pick them, okay. and Chair, I shall pick them up in the, in the minutes as well. For Brilliant. You. OK, so they've been noted and will be further acted upon um, by the Standards Committee and by the Monitoring Officer. Um, and so with that assurance to myself and others, 
Could I have a proposer and a seconder for the recommendations, please? David is proposing. Martin, um, thousands of people are seconding, but I saw Martin. <laughs> uh, but Claire, I think, has her hand up. Yes, I did have my hand up. I, I just wanted just an, an observation. I know we, we mentioned it about the safeguarding and I know, Hilary, you've sent an email round to everybody and it is one of those book on. Could it not be that we just send everybody the invitation and they click either to accept or reject just because I'm I'm always concerned that that and that way it then gets put in people's calendar and that it's just it's sometimes rather than asking to be included in the numbers maybe if we did it as an invitation we might get higher response and then people have it in their calendars and maybe we get a bigger uptake that's a good idea claire can we try that as well hillary um if i can just uh, can i make a couple of just a quick comment um so yeah, we, do try, go on. <laughs> we do try and do both um because there are councillors that don't use their calendars and then don't then look back into their calendar to find it and once they've accepted never see it again and there are other councillors that only really use their calendar um this was actually done on behalf of the safeguarding team and i will ask and um, we can ask them to devise a calendar appointment to send out to members brilliant lovely uh ruth yes i was just thinking from what's been raised i um, i know we've said um jeanette's going to take them away but um Nicholas specifically raised that it was in the gift of this committee to make certain training like the code of conduct training mandatory. So do we need to vote separately on that? I just point a procedure about whether we want that to be mandatory or not, because we don't meet very often. So if we don't do it now, we'll never do it. Well, we won't do it for a long enough time. I just wondered whether we needed to vote on, on that or not. Well, I would suggest um, that it, um, could be taken away. I mean, I think if it's going to become mandatory, it should be from May. Um, and we do have another meeting before May. I, I'm a bit loath to just plonk it onto the committee without any background papers or work uh, to make a decision of that sort. I, I prefer it if we came back to it in a, in a more considered way. And I think we do have time to do that. Okay, that's fair, that's fair enough. I just want to make, wanted to make sure it wasn't overlooked, that's all. Okay. Uh, Martin? Yeah, uh, uh, you said most of what I wanted to say, but I think as, as the uh, champ, training cha or development champions, you were going to take away and look at uh, bringing lots of things together. And I think it's in that context that we can look at putting the programme together that we would expect everyone to do. And I know there are, there are uh, tripwires in terms of whether it's mandatory or whether it's we encourage everyone to do it. And I think we need to think of that as well. Claire? Yeah, just, can, just adding on that. And also I think we're gonna wait and see what the, the guidance is that comes out as well. So it needs to be all wrapped up together. Um, from somebody who did the, the uh, introduction to being a councillor training some <coughs> years ago, um, uh, I, think, I think it was very good for a new councillor uh, that you have to go through something to get you orientated into what your role is when you first step through the doors um, and also know how to behave at meetings. So I think that's excellent training. But whether or not it has to be repeated um, or whether or not it, it or a refreshed, not on possibly on an annual basis, but I'd perhaps ask uh, you know, Jeanette and that when she's looking at that and coming back to us and suggest that maybe it is done as a, the refresher is done when you come back, if you're re-elected after a four year period that you have uh, another look to go through it because I think you always I always say with training you, you never know it all and you always learn something and you always pick up something that you missed the first time you did the training because I think when you when you look at trainers and they actually say to you when they've done the training they'll tell you how much will have been retained by the people that they've trained and well, after a, yeah. a while it's not very much well I put myself through the whole induction program in uh, May uh, 2019 um, when I was re-elected and I've been a councillor for quite a long time um, but I still think it's absolutely vital that we that we do take advantage of the training opportunities and the development and the, the space to think uh, that's made available to us wh when, whenever we possibly can so I would certainly agree with that. Okay so it's quite a long time since I asked for a proposal and seconder so I've almost <laughs> forgotten where we were 
uh, but it was proposed by David and seconded by Martin and lots of other people um, that we accept the recommendations before us. Um, so are we um, able to go to the most exciting moment of the evening, which is, which is a vote? Are we ready to go to a vote? There's no other blue hand up. So, Hilary, do you have to tell us how to do it now? No, I'm sure you all know how to do it. Um, <laughs> okay, so, so it's yes or green no. Tick for yes, green tick for yes, uh, red cross for no, and blue hand to abstain. Okay, so we've got a couple of new people with us tonight. So three new people Please. with us tonight. Uh, so but I'll remember, you've got a few thank votes. And IP thank vote as well. Oh, all right, okay. So we do all know. All right, shut up, Judy. All right. <laughs> Okay, that looks... That's carried, Chair. Yeah. Yes. And I just learned something because I didn't know that only the um, district councillors voted. And I should have known that, really. So apologies, everyone. Um, so I think, unless I've totally misunderstood something, um, the next um, meeting of the Standards Committee is slightly later than I thought it was, actually. Um, it's the 13th of April. I thought we met again in February. Um, so we really will have to have done some work and got some things in place for induction before then. Um, and there's nothing else I can think of to say um, other than to thank you all very much. Peter, you're muted, dear boy. Uh, right. Well, uh, just now, uh, this may be an inopportune moment to say this, but it, uh, it strikes me. I understand why John, Nicholas and I don't vote. Um, but I can't quite understand why our district counts, our uh, parish councillors aren't allowed to vote. And maybe we could ask um, Jeanette to think about that for the next time. Well, it may be that she doesn't have to just Legislation, it's the requirements it. of legislation. So yeah. um, it, they're non, and it's set out in our constitution, Peter. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so right. it's, but it's, I just, it was in the context uh, in particular, your opening remark, Judy, was that we were a welcoming body in North Hearts, and I wouldn't like our parish councillors to feel that they were somehow uh, rather lower down the beyond the salt than they I ought agree. to be. I agree. I agree, but nevertheless, it is a legislative yeah. uh, matter. Yeah. It's not a matter of the unwelcomingness of North no, Hearts. No. As long as everybody understands that. Whose welcomes are second to none. <laughs> and I hope that everybody felt that this evening. Um, and on that fluffy note, um, <laughs> can I thank everybody very much indeed and close the meeting. So bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.